All right, so tonight I'm going to preach on the topic of conflict resolution. I know I'm still sort of touching on topics to do with that controversy. I suppose when I was going through it, a lot of things were being brought up and it just made me think about all these things. And also just, um, you know, a lot of misconceptions that people have about Christianity. Uh, and it's just like when, when, when these sort of controversies and conflicts happen, all these, all these misconceptions and misapplied verses start to come out and you realize, man, are people actually believing like what the world believes about Christianity instead of what the Bible actually teaches? So what I mean by that, I'll talk about that as I go into um, com the topic of conflict resolution. Now, I'm not feeling 100%, so I, won't, I may not be uh, as, as lively as I normally am, uh, but I've got a lot of verses to go through and hopefully you'll learn a lot from this sermon tonight. So conflict resolution what happens when somebody does you wrong what's the right way to go about it what's the right way of going about to correct somebody if it's not you that they're doing wrong it's just they're doing wrong to others and you've seen them just uh, commit a sin um, now what i found is the way people deal with conflict uh, and what they think how christians christians are meant to deal with conflict um, i'm reminded of the verses like a lot of verses that are commonly misapplied in the Bible. And when I think of commonly misapplied verses, I think of verses like, judge not, right? Where, where what the world thinks Christianity is about when they say Christians shouldn't judge and what the Bible actually teaches about judging, right? And, and it's not saying that we never ever judge. It's judge not that ye be not judged before with what measure ye meet, you know, ye judge, ye shall be judged, right? And, you know, just ignoring the whole fact that if you take the Bible as a whole, I mean, the Bible is full of judgments, you know, I mean, God is judgment. I mean, even in the New Testament epistles, I mean, Paul is constantly rebuking the Corinthian church for the things that they're doing wrong. He's calling out sin, you know, Peter and John, I mean, all the apostles in the New Testament are like listing all these different sins. I mean, why are they being so judgmental if, if, if Christianity is meant to be teaching that we're not meant to be judgmental? So obviously they've got that doctrine wrong you know another one is you know when they say you love your enemies and love your enemies means you don't hate anything that you know you, you you're just going to let like criminal injustices just go without without a pass you know murder shouldn't be punished you know adultery shouldn't be punished slander shouldn't be punished just you know you just love your enemies just meaning like just let all sin go let all crime go um that that we're not just we're just not meant we just as christians just meant to throw our hands up and just say you know just let it slide and what I want to talk about today is just how we deal with conflict, because when, when conflict happens in the, in the Christian world amongst Christians, sometimes what people will say is they'll say things like, oh, you should just turn the other cheek. You should just suffer yourself to be defrauded. Um, you should just let it go. And you know, what it, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of this Ned Flanders Christianity. I don't know how many of you guys watched Simpsons when you were younger, but... You know, what do I mean by Ned Flanders Christianity? If you're familiar with The Simpsons, and I know I used to watch it when I, before, I mean, Simpsons is such a blasphemous show. It's not something that you should be watching now, obviously, and, and letting your children, to, children watch. But I just remember, you know, when we think about the stereotypical Christianity that the world thinks, I mean, that's pretty much what they tried to show in Ned Flanders in, in The Simpsons, right? Where this guy, he's just walked all over, but one thing to do with conflict resolution, do you remember, because he was the neighbor of Homer Simpson, you remember that Homer would just, just take advantage of him all the time, just borrow all these things and never give them back, just treat him like, you know, like rubbish all the time? And what was Ned Flanders' response? Just to brush it off, just to suffer himself to be defrauded, just to let it go. Until eventually, if you remember, there was this one episode where he was just bottling it all up, he was just bottling it all up, he was bottling it all up, and then what happened? Right? And then he just lost it because all that bitterness had been building up inside of him because he wasn't dealing with it the way the Bible talks about dealing with conflict. He was just letting it go, brushing it off, brushing it off until he finally snapped and lost it. And then he just lost it at everyone. And then that's what the Bible talks about when it says, many be defiled. So there's this sort of Ned Flanders Christianity, um, you know, that people think about, you know, dealing with conflict. So I want to just teach you today, just go through some of the verses and, and just give you a few principles on, on how Christians are meant to deal with conflict and what the Bible actually teaches. And go to these verses where we talk about turning the other cheek, 
suffering yourself to be defrauded. I want to show you guys that these are often misapplied verses where people are just using these to say that you just take it like Ned Flanders and just let it go, just brush it off, just bottle it up and just deal with it. Um, whereas that is not what the Bible is teaching at all. Now, there is a place for long suffering and forbearance. Now, what do I mean by that? Where, you know, not every conflict is worth you know, causing a fuss about. So it's not, I'm not saying that everything you make a big deal out of because not everything is worth making a big deal out of. Sometimes, uh, you know, you might just want to suffer it and you might just want to forbear. So if someone does wrong to you, what is the right way of going about resolving it? So the first question you might want to ask is, is it, is it even worth causing a fuss over? Because remember, we live with sinners. We're in a church with different sinners. We work with sinners. You know, all of us are sinners. We're all, none of us are perfect. We're going to say things and do things that will offend people and will rub people the wrong way. And then you've got to ask the question first, I mean, is it even worth getting offended over? Is it even worth getting upset over? Is this something that is, is, is it something worth causing a fuss over? And some questions you might ask is, you know, does it affect the fellowship? Like, is this person, you know, doing you wrong so much to the point where you can't have fellowship with this person? Or, you know, does it affect your service? You know, is there such a rift between you and this other person that you're unable to serve together and you're unable to do things together? It's affecting your fellowship, right? It's affecting your service. Or does it affect your reputation? Maybe they've said something about you and it's affecting your reputation and it's something you have to deal with. So these are things where there's not a right or wrong answer. This is something that uh, you decide. Um, so in which case, if it doesn't, you, might, you may just let it go, right? You may just forbear it and suffer the wrong done against you but, but this is not forgiveness. So some people will just say, just forgive and forget. Forgiveness is very different. And I'll, go about, go, I'll talk about that in a moment. What people normally think about when they think about you know, forgiveness, just letting it go, forgiving and forgetting, not actually dealing with the problem, what they are actually talking about is being long suffering and forbearing, which is like when people are wronging you, people have wronged you or they're ridiculing you or they're falsely accusing you and you just decide, you know what, this is not even worth it. I'm not going to deal. I'm not going to bother dealing with it. You're just being long suffering. You're just taking that wrong and not doing anything about it. You know, you're just allowing that to, to, to pass. Uh, and we see this in the Bible, that this is, is a good quality that a Christian should have. You need to decide what conflicts you're going to deal with and which ones you're just going to let go. Ephesians 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where we are called, with all lowliness and meekness, right? So having the right attitude ourselves, that we are humble, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Why? Endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So as much as life in you, right, you live peaceably with all men. Colossians 3, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind and meekness. So this is the sort of parallel passage that we read just before in Ephesians 4. Long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So these are different elements of conflict resolution, right? Like one is you just, you know, you just decide, you know, I'm just going to leave it and let it go. And the other is where there's actually forgiveness, where somebody is actually approaching you and, and letting you know you've done wrong and trying to resolve that conflict. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So that's that same, I believe, that keeping the unity in the spirit, in the bond of peace, this bond of perfectness, because we want to be as much as possible unified and in unity in this church. Let's look at, look at a couple of other verses that mention this long suffering. This is 2 Timothy 4. He says, I charge thee therefore, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long, suf long suffering and doctrine. So remember when we talked about people thinking that Christianity shouldn't be a judgmental Christianity where they're totally wrong, right? The Bible doesn't teach us not to judge. It's talking about hypocritical judgment. Because why? We're meant to preach the word. We're meant to let people know what is right. We're meant to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Why with all long suffering and doctrine? Because when you do that, a lot of people are going to do you wrong. 
right? A lot of people are going to say things about you. A lot of people are going to, you know, want to do evil things to your family. I mean, even with this whole marriage thing that's happening, I mean, them going, you know, there was that protest in, in, the, in the ACT and then, you know, the homosexual agenda comes and just screams and just ruins their event uh, totally disrespectfully. Um, I think they handled it well, though, from what I've seen. But uh, uh, not, not the, obviously not the, not, not the homosexuals, the, 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 the Christians that were there handled it well, and they just, were, were, just kept going with what they were saying. Um, but a lot of people are going to do you wrong when you stand up for the truth. So this is this long-suffering, right? That it's not, it's not always worth dealing with every single conflict. And, and, you know, I have dealt with conflicts before, but there's a lot I don't deal with. I mean, if you read all the YouTube comments, I don't answer every single one of them, you know, because it's just, it's just, it's just, sometimes it's just not worth it, right? I just suffer the things that are said um, because sometimes it's not worth it. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, and you'll see that God is the same, right? God is long-suffering. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this is not, you know, the turning from your sins to salvation. This is the repentance of changing your mind to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's not willing that any should perish, go to hell, but that all should come to repentance, that they should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But see, he's not just ending the world now. He's long-suffering because he's allowing people to just, you know, spit in his face and things like that because he wants to give them time, hopefully, to one day, you know, to believe on him and to get saved. Uh, now, beware of bitterness. Now, like I said, with long-suffering and forbearance, this is something that is decided by the offended party, right? This is not something that is demanded of by the offending party, right? Like if you've offended somebody, right, and they come to you and say, you've done me wrong, it's not your place to tell them, just let it go, right? And tell them to forbear, tell them to like, you know, um, to be long-suffering when obviously they've come to try and resolve that conflict, right? So forbearing and long-suffering is something that the offended party decides that, you know what, I'm just going to let it go and not, do, and you know, it's fine. It's not disrupting any fellowship. You know, maybe they're not even aware that they've done me wrong, you know, and it's just, I'm just going to let it go and move on. Um, now, why do I say beware of bitterness? Because see, the danger, you don't want to just always deal with conflict that way. Because there's a danger that if you keep just forbearing and you just keep long-suffering, like I mentioned when I talked about Ned Flanders, right, that that's not healthy either. That's not the right way a Christian just responds every single time when you know that it's brewing in you, that there's this bitterness that is brewing in you and you now are starting to sin in your mind and, and you know, there are these things uh, sort of dwelling up inside of you that are not holy. So, like I said, you don't want to keep the bitterness and be defiled because too much hurt that is just bottled up is not good either. Especially, you know, when people sometimes, are, like I said, they, they get into this Ned Flanders type of Christianity where they actually think this is the more righteous thing to do, that, you know, you just let it go and let it go and let it go until, until one day you snap. Oh yeah, I remember I put this, this photo in. So if you remember in that episode as well, um, that after Ned Flanders he flips out, right? He actually has to go to a mental asylum and they have to try and treat him um, because he actually goes, I think he actually goes crazy or something like that. Now look at what it says in Hebrews 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men. So yes, we are striving to be at peace with all men but not at the cost of your own sanity, not at the cost of your own uh, holiness inside, not at the cost of your bitterness where your life is being destroyed and you know you're getting bitter. You need to resolve that conflict. This is where we, you have to decide, is it worth causing that fuss? But if your own life is destroyed, you're getting bitter, you're starting to hate your brother in Christ, then you need to resolve it, right? You can't just have that bitterness inside of you. Why? Because one day you might just snap and cause even more damage and this is what happens a lot in relationships, any relationship, right? In a marriage where it just builds up, it builds up. That's why the Bible says, you know, that to love your wives and be not bitter against them. Because sometimes a husband will do the same. He'll just let it go. He'll just let it go. And then one day he just punches his wife in the face or something like that because he, he's not dealing with it properly. He's not dealing with the conflict. And obviously, you know, it's, it always works both ways. But my point is, you know, don't get into this trap that you think, that the holy and righteous thing to do is just always just bottle it up. Look at what it says here. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, 
lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. See, so usually when you're bitter, you know when people get bitter at people, they always say, you're not actually hurting the other person by just dwelling it up inside. All it's hurting is really you. You know, it's just troubling yourself. And sometimes that's a reason to go and resolve the conflict because maybe that person is not even aware that they're hurting you that much, but it's hurting you and you need to seek resolution. Uh, Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. See, because if you have bitterness inside of you, you have this unholy hatred inside of you, it is troubling you, you're going to affect a lot of people as well, especially if you're, you know, you're, you're a parent, you know what I mean, you're in a position of leadership. If you have undealt conflict and you haven't dealt with it right, you will defile many others that look to you as an example uh, when you finally flip out and do the wrong thing. So um, let's go on. So what about seeking a resolution? So you may choose to seek a resolution because, like I said, there may be a benefit uh, to reconciliation. But remember, uh, as we go into this here now, resolution is actually the, 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 the responsibility of both parties. So I want to show you those two verses here. First, I want to show you that the responsibility of the, the offendee, right? The person that's actually doing the offending. Is that the offendee? The offender. Offender is the person that's doing the offending. The offendee is the person getting offended. So in Matthew 5, verse 23, l- listen to this. It says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Now, a couple of words I've underlined there just to prompt what I wanted to tell you guys about this verse. But one thought is, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean every single person that thinks that they have been wronged by you, you have to go get right with before you can give something to God. I don't think that's what this scripture is teaching. Because remember how we saw before that if you're going to preach the word, you're going to preach the Bible, a lot of people are going to think that they've been done wrong by you, but you actually haven't done something wrong, right? So obviously there is the situation where you haven't actually done something wrong and somebody just thinks that they've been wronged. This verse is not teaching that you need to be right with absolutely everybody in the world and in the online world before you can sacrifice something to God. What this verse is teaching is if you know you've done something wrong, do you know what I mean? Like if you actually know you have done something wrong and you have somebody that you've offended and you know that they are offended by that, don't come and give something to God. Don't come and, serve, don't, don't come and give something to God when then you have this unresolved conflict that you know you have done wrong. That's what I believe this passage is teaching in light of all scripture, right? So it says, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. So that's where the offender knows that they've done something wrong. They have a responsibility in the Bible to go and make it right. Now let's look at this one where you believe you have been offended. You're the offendee now and there's a conflict there. You can't, you can't just have this attitude that they're the ones that have done wrong. They need to come to me and apologize because this verse actually flies in the face of that thought that you are absolutely absolved from all responsibility of resolving that conflict just because you're the one that was done, the wrong was done to. Because look at what it says here in Matthew 18. This is really the, 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 the main passage in, 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 in how we deal with conflict and how we have this due process of uh, escalation within the local church. So Matthew 18, it says here, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. So you see here that the person who is actually going to the brother is the one that has actually been wronged. He's the offendee, right, going to the offender. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. So you see that the first step is you try and approach that person on their own. When they've done you wrong, right? So we'll talk about later when somebody just does wrong in general and then you see that person do a sin. I'll deal with that a bit later. So this is when somebody has wronged you personally. You go to them, right? And you you go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now, there's a couple of things about this passage. Now, one is the point of bringing two or three witnesses is so that the situation can be um, established, right? What is actually going on? Um, 
Another thing is, see, I've heard other people talk about verse 16 as though it is okay if there are, if there's one or two other people that have gone to talk to the offender privately themselves, and now there are just two or three people with the same story. Now, to me, that, that is a gross misinterpretation of this passage, because the, the whole idea of bringing two or three people with you is so that there's an audience, and then also when the accuser is saying, you've done me wrong, the person who is accused can also respond saying, you know, and present their case between the two or three witnesses. So it's not that, you know, Alex wrongs me, or Alex does something wrong, and then, you know, Simon goes and talks to, to him, and, and then somebody else goes to talk, but we're never in the same room together. And it's just, then I, then I just say, oh yeah, I've already, I've already taken that step of two or three witnesses because other people have talked to Alex when he did me wrong, kind of thing. No, because it says here, but if you will not hear thee, take with thee, so you see that the two or three witnesses are with you, one or two, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So there's this conversation that happens with the two or three witnesses. It's not just that two or three people are saying the same thing, and then thou therefore it's true. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Because why? Because they could be a false witness. Like if, if, if something didn't happen, you know, and then I just have like two or three or four people come to me, just saying the same thing, but I've never got everyone in the same room with the offender there as well to establish every word. How do you know it's not just false accusations that are being brought up? Where's the diligent inquisition that's happening to make sure that number one, that their stories all line up, that they're all not just coming behind people's back and saying things, saying things behind that person's back, you know? If they're gonna accuse somebody of something and be a witness, then they need to say it also in front of the person that they're accusing, right? Um, so that's the second step. The second step is that there are two or three people that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But even if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and as a publican. So you can see here that through the church's due process, you know, it can be found that, you know, because somebody might not even get to the third step, right? Because let's say, for example, at the second step, they can't find two or three witnesses. There's not two or three people that want to really, you know, support their case, right? And say, no, they actually haven't done you wrong. You should just sort of... So then they can't actually get to the point where they're bringing it to the church if they can't even um, establish it in the, two or in, in the case of two or three witnesses. Um, now, another thing is, you know, this is Jesus talking here, talking about dealing with conflict. Now, remember how we talked about, you know, where people just think the righteous thing is just to let it go. Now, if that was the case, why would we, why would we even have verse 16 and verse 17? If the idea was just, you know, go and tell your brother between him, you and him alone, I mean, we wouldn't even have that, right? I mean, if the whole idea was just, you know, if somebody does you wrong, you just let it go and just bottle it up and just move on. I mean, why, why is he saying here, if your brother trespasses against you, go and tell him his fault? Right? It's, it's, it's not this idea that you just let it go, you just brush it off, you just bottle it up. No, if it's affecting you, you go and you tell your fault. You go and deal with it. If he doesn't listen, it's not like, okay, oh, he's not going to hear me out between me and him alone. Therefore, just let it go. It's still not like that. Right? He says, if he will not hear thee, then there's another step. And if he doesn't hear that, there's another step. So you see how like, there's not this idea that you just leave this conflict unresolved or you just bottle it up when it's actually affecting you. Um, What's another thing? Uh, I already talked about the being together. Now, think about this as well. This situation only works when this person is actually in the church that you're in. Because if somebody's in another church, how do you, how do you deal with them in that way? The, the way you have to deal with them is try and approach their church, right? Try and approach their church and try and get it resolved that way if they have done you wrong. So sometimes it's not easy to go through these steps because you know, the, the assumption here is that this person has wronged you and you're actually able to go to them physically. You know, now we live in an online world where people actually live across the world. It's not always easy to do these sorts of things. Um, what else did I want to mention here? Uh, okay, these two points are for the next point. So you see here that there is this, these steps that you go through. So there's not this idea that you always just forbear, you always just long suffer. There, is this, there, there, is this, there are these steps here to actually seek a resolution and actually resolve this conflict. 
Now, just a point on forgiveness, because like I said, people have this wrong idea of what forgiveness is as opposed to what long suffering and forbearing is. So when you long suffer, when you forbear is when you just take that wrong and you decide, you know, it's not worth it, I'm just gonna move on. But if it's actually affecting you and you actually seek forgiveness of this person, like I said, it's not up to the offender to say you should just let it go. If you're telling them, hey, you have actually offended me and you're actually doing wrong to say, hey, you should just forgive when they actually haven't even asked for forgiveness. So I wanna show you a couple of verses here in the Bible that show how forgiveness actually works. So what is forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is when you do somebody wrong, you ask for forgiveness and then they then they let it go, right? They let it go as though you had not done it because you have repented and you have admitted your wrong and you have asked for forgiveness. And in some, in some situations, asking for forgiveness is enough. But in other situations, a church may judge that there needs to be restitution, right? Because if you've like cheated somebody of like tens of thousands of dollars, you know, like, and, they, and then you just think that, oh, if I just say sorry, they should forgive me of it. No, because there is still that, that element of church discipline and church judging where the church may say, hey, you know what? No, you actually have to pay this person back. You know, you have to pay this money back. So sometimes if they've just offended somebody, that's where forgiveness might be enough. But if it's, there's actually a crime that's been committed or you've actually done somebody wrong materialistically, the church may actually judge, no, you actually have to do this. And if they refuse to hear the church, like the Bible says, let him be unto thee as a heathen man, and a publican. So I've just underlined there that he's as a heathen man, because it doesn't mean that if you escalate once, twice to the church, he doesn't hear you, that they are not saved, right? It's just that they are as a heathen man. You can now treat them as somebody who is an unbeliever, and that's where we'll get to 1 Corinthians 6 in a, in a bit later on in the sermon. So forgiveness, let's look at a couple of verses. I wanna show you from the Bible that this is how forgiveness works. Forgiveness is not what people often think of, which is long suffering and forbearing, which is just letting it go. Forgiveness, for somebody to actually forgive and be required to forgive, it requires the offender to actually admit they are wrong and ask for forgiveness. And this actually works the exact same way with God. So we're just going a couple of verses down now. We're just reading in Matthew 18 verses 15 to 17. This is verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times, right? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times. Oh, excuse me. Until seven times, there, uh, until seven, but until 70 times seven. So we do learn that if somebody keeps asking for forgiveness, you are required to keep on forgiving them, right? There's no, there's no sort of limit to how many times you forgive them. That's why Peter's saying here, do I only have to do it up to seven times? And Jesus is saying, no, 70 times seven. And he's not saying once you get to 77 times, then therefore that's the limit. He's just making the point that, you know, that, that it's not limited, right? So he says, therefore is the king. Now he goes into this parable of what? The unforgiving servant, right? This is the parable of the unforgiving servant. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all he had and payment to be made. Now in this parable, this Lord represents God, right? Because later on he says, if you don't forgive them, God will not forgive you, right? So you can already ask the question, well, why didn't the Lord just let it go? Right? No, he's demanding payment to be made, right? He's saying he owes him a debt and he's demanding payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. So you see, there is a repentance here where the guy is actually admitted, I do owe you this money and I'm not able to pay it. Like basically, please forgive me. Only when he does that, right? Because before he does that, what is the Lord doing? The Lord is demanding that he pay the debt, right? To the point where he's saying, you know what? Sell his wife, sell his children, because payment needs to be made, right? He's not just, just letting it go and just long suffering because this is a huge debt that has been owed to him. Verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. So now he's repented, right? He's repenting and he's, and he's saying, I'm sorry, and he's doing and he's, and he's admitting he's wrong. Um, he loosed him and forgave him the debt. 
But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And now he goes to somebody that owes him money. And his fellow servant, as likewise, right, admits that he's wrong and asks for forgiveness. As his fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into the prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt. Look at this, because thou desirest me. So you see how he only forgave him because he asked for forgiveness, not because he was just required. It's not like the guy that owed him debt just saying, you should just let my debt go. Right? No, it's, he's saying, no, he's, he's actually asking for forgiveness. That's why he gave the forgiveness. Because thou desirest me, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So, Obviously, there, this, this, this is not, I don't think, an application to salvation, right? Because obviously salvation, you know, you ask for salvation, you are forgiven of all your debt in, in regards to hell. But there is the, the getting right with God, right? So there is two types of asking for forgiveness. There's the one where you get saved, and then there's the daily asking for forgiveness where we wrong God and we are getting right with God. And God is saying here, uh, what I believe this parable is teaching is that if you... Um, you know, uh, if somebody wrongs you and they actually turn to you and say, please forgive me, and you don't forgive them, then your relationship's not right with God either, right? Until you get that right with your brother and sister in Christ. Um, let's look at a couple of other passages. Luke 17, verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, does it say just let him go? No, right? If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent forgive him. So you see how it's very consistent throughout the Bible that this is how forgiveness works, right? And when, when, when forgiveness, forgiveness can only be given when it is requested. Otherwise, it's just a wrong that is suffered, right? It's a wrong that is suffered and it's, the, it's a conflict that is not resolved. So you see here, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, you see there, thou shalt forgive him. So this works the same way with God. Right? I already showed you the parable of the unforgiving servant. Look at here, and this is a very famous verse in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you see here, even forgiveness with God for our sins requires us to call upon him, right? To actually ask for forgiveness. Psalms 86 verse 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. So you see, he's ready to forgive. Ready for what? Ready for you to ask for forgiveness, right? If he's ready, and if you ask for forgiveness, he's ready to forgive. That's the sort of attitude we have. That if somebody comes to us and they ask for forgiveness, that we're ready to forgive. You know, we want it to be made right and we want that fellowship to be reestablished plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Now let's uh, look now. So I've gone through a couple of those passages. Let's look now at a couple of these misapplied verses that I talked about in the beginning. And the first one is in 1 Corinthians 6, where people talk about just suffering yourself to be defrauded. And I want to show you that this is not what this passage is teaching at all. Um, in 1 Corinthians 6. So 1 Corinthians 6 is where it talks about not suing your brother um, in, in, the, in the court system you know, of the world. But I don't believe it's teaching never sue your brother in the court system of the world. And I'll explain why in a moment. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says here, Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? So what people think this is saying here is that you never, ever go before the law of the unjust. And I don't believe that's what it's teaching. I'll explain why in a few moments. But what I do believe it's teaching here is that that should not be your first 
point of call. And I'll give you a perfect example of why that is. I mean, first of all, I'll tell you why that is. The first of all, well, the reason is when it talks about the unjust is because sometimes the law of the land does not line up with God's law, right? So the reason why you don't just go first of all to the law of the unjust is because you could defraud your brother or sister in Christ because you go and get a court order which is actually sin or is actually wrong in the eyes of God rather than it de being dealt with the right way, which is what, um, why you're meant to go through uh, you know, Matthew 18 of going to them first, going in the mouth of two or three witnesses and then bring it to the church and then the church judging first. And then the church may then judge that, hey, the right thing to do is you go to the court, right? Because, you know, that's maybe the only way you can get your money back or something like that. So I don't think it's saying never go. What I do think it's saying is you don't go to the courts first and foremost. And a perfect example is that is in dom domestic disputes, right? Because why? Because if you go to the law of the unjust, for any reason, a wife can take out an AVO on her husband, right? And, and, and that AVO means like, you know, that the husband can't go within however many feet of the house or whatever for any reason at all. No reason at all. A wife can just go and just not want because I, I can't remember what it is. I shouldn't have to, <laughs> uh, have to remind me. But I think there's some reason where you have a right to your privacy or something like that. So you can take out an AVO on anyone, right? But is that biblical? Should a wife be allowed to tell her husband that you, for, for just for any reason you cannot come near to me, right? And this is the problem if you go to the law of the unjust first, that they will let you do things like that. Whereas a church is going to say, no, that's not how you deal with it. That is wrong. That's the wrong way to deal with it. Um, and that's just a perfect example of just the stupid laws that our government puts in place that totally destroy families and, 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 you know, and don't allow people to even resolve conflict. Because what does the Bible say? When you've done wrong, you've got to deal with it, right? You've got to go to the person. You don't go to the court and say that that person can't even call me, can't even see me, can't even be in my presence. I mean, how are you going to resolve the conflict with a law like that? Uh, let's go on to verse 4. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 4. If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, right? What does the Bible say? Not deal with it? No, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Now, he's not saying that this is what you should do, right? He says, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So you see how when there's a conflict, right? 1 Corinthians 6 is not just saying just suffer yourself to be defrauded all the time in every instance, because it's saying here, don't go to the courts. No, no, if there's something that needs to be dealt with, Deal with it in church. If you're not, if, it's like saying, hey, even the least person, even the least esteemed in church is going to be a better judge of conflict than the world is going to be. And that's why you go to church first. So you see how it's not just saying just let it go, not deal with it. No, you deal with it. And it's saying here you deal with it in church. That's why he's saying, I mean, ideally, obviously, it would be the elders, right? And the bishops of the church, you know, dealing with that conflict, you'd hope that they have a bit more wisdom of the world to deal with that and a bit more soberness. But what Paul is saying here is that even the least esteemed in church is better than going before the law of the unjust first, right? I speak to your shame. Is it not so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Why? Because that is a place of church. There is a place in church where we judge between brethren and try and sort it out. But this is where I think the Jehovah's, I think it's the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons that got it wrong, where there's like, you know, pedophiles and stuff in the Jehovah's Witness church, and then they just deal with it in church, and they just feel like, oh, they've been rebuked in church, and that's enough, right? Even though it's a criminal matter. So this is why I don't think we never go to the court of law. Uh, verse 6, but brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. Now, like I said, what I don't think this is teaching is that there isn't a place for the government to get involved, right? Because like in the case of the Jehovah's Witness Church, when there are pedophiles that ought to have the, 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 the sort of government deal with them, you know, rebuking them and excommunicating them from church is not enough, right? They ought to be reported and 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 things like that so what is this saying it's because they were taking them to law first and for things that should be dealt in church and that's why they're defrauding one another like i said like the example that i gave of a wife going out right and taking out an avo that is defrauding her husband 
right? Because she's doing the wrong thing. And that's why he's saying, you know, if somebody does that to you, that doesn't justify you then going to the court first and then defrauding them, right? That's why he's saying you suffer yourselves to be defrauded, meaning if somebody defrauds you by going to the legal system, that doesn't justify you. You suffer yourself to be defrauded, but you deal with it the right way. What's the right way to deal with it? Because you can't just understand 1 Corinthians 6 and ignore Matthew 18, right? Because Matthew 18 says if your brother trespasses against you, what do you do? You go to him. You go in the mouth of two or three witnesses. You bring it before the church. That's how you suffer yourself to be defrauded because you've been defrauded by them taking out some unjust AVO against you. But how do you respond? You don't respond by also doing the same thing and taking them before the court of law and using the law as a hammer against them. No, you do the right thing by going to them, mouth of two or three witnesses, bringing it to the church. And if they don't hear you, now what? Right? When we go back to Matthew 18, uh, here, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man, as a publican. So remember, you don't go to the law to, with a brother, but, but if they neglect to hear the church, can you, can, do, you, do you treat them as a brother now? Or do you treat them as an unbeliever? So let's say somebody owes you tens of thousands of dollars and you go to them and they don't hear you. They're not willing to sit down with two or three witnesses. They're not willing to hear the church. They leave to, they're not even in the church. Do you, you, do you now have no way of getting that money back? Or are you justified in going to the court and suing that person to get their money back? Now the problem is, is if you go to that way first, Right? If you go to that court system first to get your money, that's where you're wrong because you, if you didn't go through the Matthew 18 protocol. Right? But once you go through the Matthew 18 protocol, now you know, the church may judge, you know what? The only way you're going to get your money back is if you sue them, if, you, if that money... And like I said, you decide as the person who's offended whether or not it's worth you trying to get your money back. You might just think, you know what? You know, I'll just leave, you know, maybe it's only a thousand bucks or whatever. You're just like, oh, it's not worth it. I'm going to pay more in legal fees or whatever. Um, so, but that's up to the person that's offended, you know, but they're not doing anything wrong if they go through the Matthew 18 steps and now that person is now treated as a heathen, heathen or a publican and then they can take that person to court because ultimately that's why the government's there, right? Because there are some things that the church cannot do because we're not in charge, you know, this, this church here is not the government. So what's the worst we can do? The worst that we can do in church is we excommunicate, right? Until they repent. But even then, so if it's a criminal matter, or it's, it's a matter for, for, the, for the courts, that there is a place for that. So you can see here, um, you know, you can attempt to settle things with them, but if they're not willing, obviously you can take action. Um, and 1 Corinthians 6 isn't just saying, like, you know, we can't just use suffer yourself to be defrauded like the world uses judge not, and, and just uh, sort of not understand everything else that's going on in the Bible. So 1 Corinthians 6 is not just talking about letting yourself be wronged, and then just letting it go. There is steps to resolution and people are at some point justified in taking their matter to a court of law if it gets to that point and if it's worth that trouble. Um, now what about, let's go into another one, right? So that's 1 Corinthians 6. So hopefully that, that helps you understand that passage a bit more of uh, suffering yourself to be defrauded and it doesn't always mean what people think it means. The other one is... Oh, excuse me. I've got like this stomach bug, so it's just giving, making me a bit blurred. The other one is turning the other cheek, right? So on the same lines of suffering yourself to be defrauded, people just have this Ned Flanders Christianity mentality where they just think if somebody's just going to wrong you, you just take it and just let them keep wronging you. It's like, yeah, you, you might say if somebody slaps you in the face, you turn the other cheek. But, you know, what if somebody hospitalizes you? And, and, you know, you can't work, so do you, do you get no restitution at all? Of course not, right? I mean, even in the Bible, there, there are laws that if you, if, you, if you fight with somebody and then you hospitalize them, you have to give restitution. You have to get, make them well again and, and pay for their time that is down. So the Bible is obviously not teaching that if somebody just like assaults you and, and that there's no sort of recourse that you have, that you're just meant to just keep taking the beating, right? Um, that's not what turning the other cheek means. And I'll, and I'll explain um, as we go through this. Uh, so in Matthew 5, this is where this whole turning the other cheek comes from, right? Matthew 5, verse 38. You've heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I'll go over those passages in a moment because um, I'll explain to you what the Bible means by that. 
But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now I think verse 40, I'll come back to verse 40, but I think verse 40 gives us a clue about how we are meant to understand Matthew 5, 38 to 40, right? Because it starts bringing in this topic of the law, right? And going to the courts and suing somebody. But I remember I was talking to somebody once and I was talking to him about the death penalty, right? And just talking about, you know, the Bible has the death penalty and, you know, we, we weren't talking about homosexuality and whatnot, but I do believe homosexuality is the death penalty. I do believe adultery is a death penalty um, and bestiality is a death penalty. But, you know, often when you talk about the death penalty with the world, I usually just sort of keep it on topic of murder, right? Because that's something that they at least agree with, that murder is, is a big enough sin. And you can say, like, if somebody murdered your... I remember talking to a colleague once saying, if somebody murdered your son, do you, know, do you think you should pay for that murderer to just be fed and clothed and accommodated for the rest of their life in a prison? Or should that forfeit their life? Like, what's more fair? But I remember I was talking about capital punishment with a Christian once. And I said, of course I believe in the death penalty because God had the death penalty. How can that not be a, 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 an unfair judgment? Or how can that be a not, an unjust judgment when God himself punished crimes with the death penalty? I mean, are we more righteous than God? And he basically quoted this verse and he said, no, you know, no, you've heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And he says, I say unto you that you resist not evil, right? You turn the other cheek. And, and basically what he was meaning by that is if somebody commits murder, I mean, should there be no punishment at all? Do you know what I mean? Even if somebody doesn't believe in capital punishment, they don't believe in no punishment, right? It's not like somebody can just murder 10 people and the government just says, hey, we don't want to resist evil with evil, right? It's not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. We don't want to, res we don't want to resist evil. Of course not. You know, like, that, that's crazy if you think there should be no punishment. So nobody thinks no punishment. It's just what the punishment should be. That's what people are debating over, right? What the punishment should be. And obviously we, sh we think, you know, that the Bible's right when it says capital punishment. But if somebody is going to take this verse to mean that you cannot even criminally punish somebody. Obviously, they have the wrong interpretation of what this verse is talking about, right? So what is it? What do I think it means? I'll just explain what I think it means first, and then we'll go to a couple other verses. But see, what I think it's talking about, it's like the suffer yourself to be defrauded, right? If somebody hits you in the face, if somebody assaults you, you don't then have the right to go and assault them, you know, be a vigilante, take the law into your own hands. Right? It's kind of like this idea that if, you know, maybe if you're in school, right, and somebody, you know, somebody beats you up, so then you go and like, you, you know, you go and smash their bike up or something. You know, like this idea that, you know, somebody does something to your wife, so you go with a baseball bat and you wait for them in a dark place and then you go beat them up. That's what it's talking about, resisting evil with evil, right? Like you, you don't, when, when it says you don't resist evil, it doesn't mean that the government doesn't resist evil. It means you don't take the law into your own hands and then deal with that evil yourself, right? That's why when somebody smites you, you don't fight back. But does that mean you can't charge them for assault or you can't deal with them in one way if they've hospitalized you, right? What about those guys? You know, you remember there was that game that these little hooligans were playing, right? Was it called Knockout or something? Where they would just choose these random people and then they just run up to them and just see if they can knock them out with one punch. Do you think the Christian response is just, well, he should have just turned the other cheek. You know, they come and knock you out, they just turn the other cheek. Even though they're like on the ground, knocked out, maybe hospitalized, made have cost them money. Don't you think the government ought to bring those people to justice and, and, and make it right? Of course. You know, so, so obviously people are, are misunderstanding these passages. Now, let me, let me just go, I want to just show you the Old Testament passages that where... Um, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is actually used. Because the reason why Jesus is bringing this up and he says, you have heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is because in that day and age, I guess what we're reading from this is that's how people were using that law. Because obviously in the Old Testament, you do know it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, right? And there are reasons why it says that. And we'll go to each of those passages and I'll explain to you. But why does Jesus bring it up here? It's because people were abusing that passage, Right? Just like when the Pharisees went to Jesus, right? And they're saying, can a, can a man put away his wife for every cause? 
Why? Because they were misunderstanding the law of Moses. They were misunderstanding what the exceptions were. It wasn't that just because God gave a bill of divorcement, therefore you can just divorce your wife for every cause. And just because there was a law that said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, it doesn't mean then therefore you go and take the law into your own hands and if somebody hits you, you can then hit them back and be justified, right? So that's not what it's saying at all. And this is why Jesus is saying that ye resist not evil, right? Because the government's job is to resist evil. Now let's look at the first time this eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is mentioned in the Old Testament. Exodus 21. It says here, if men strive, now I just underline that because I want you to capture what's going on here, that this is not unaggravated assault, right? When you don't actually, like, you know, the knockout game is unaggravated assault, right? Because you didn't actually do anything to those kids, just came up and assaulted you. Um, but this is not the situation. This is a situation where two men are arguing and then they start fighting, right, for whatever reason. It says, and they hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her. And it says here, and yet no mischief follow. He shall surely, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So what's happening here, right? He's saying here that there's a fight that breaks out a woman with child loses the baby, right? But it says after no mischief follow. Now what I believe this means is that there was no revenge happening after that, right? Because what might happen? Two men might fight and then the man finds out that because of that fight and that struggle, his wife lost the baby. And what does he do? He goes and gets revenge, right? Goes with the baseball bat or whatever, waits in the dark place, you know, that sort of thing. So that's what I believe this mischief following is talking about. So he's saying here, if there's no mischief that follows, then what's the right way to go about it? Then he'll bring him to the judges, right? It says, the woman's husband will lay upon him. He shall be according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. So then the wife, the family then sues that man because of that struggle, they lost a baby. And then that man who was part of that fight then has to pay a fine, right? To that family, not to the government right? So it's to, the, to that family, right? It's so weird when the government wants to protect everyone, they take money and they take the money. Like, you know, they, it's, it, it's, they're trying to right a wrong. It should be money paid to the person that's wronged. So it's paid to, to that person and then that's, that's done, right? But look at what it says here, verse 23. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So you see how in Matthew 5 they were misapplying eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, because what is the actual law? The actual law is if they strive, a baby's lost, and then the man goes and takes the law into his own hand, mischief follows. If he then does that, then the law is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So if he goes and hits the guy over the head with a baseball bat, he's going to have his head hit over with a baseball bat. So it's, what, what is it doing? Is it saying, therefore, you can take your own revenge? No, it's, it's trying to discourage taking your own revenge, and it's taking a hard stance that if you do take the law into your own hands, this is how the law is going to deal with you, right? So the right way to deal with it is that you'll get, you get a fine and you pay for it. When you strive together, you lose a baby. If you go and take the law into your own hands, then it's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Whatever you do to them, you break his legs, your legs are going to be broken, right? It's to discourage vigilante justice. Let's look at uh, verse uh, Leviticus 24. Um, it says here, And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbour, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he has caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. Now again, is this vigilante justice? No, because this is something that the judges dish out, right? There is a court system in the Old Testament where they come, they bring them before a court, and then they dish out the punishment. Now, the reason why I underline if men strive, see, because in this instance, there's a fight that's going on. But what's happening here, what I believe verse uh, Leviticus 24 is talking about is unaggravated assault, right? Because there are situations in the Bible where people are fighting and it's aggravated. But this is discouraging that if you just unaggravated go and assault somebody, you know, playing some stupid knockout game, then, then you ought to get punched in the face as well. If you're going to go and punch somebody in the face, then somebody ought to punch you in the face as well. Um, And this is what this is talking about. This is the justice of if you cause a blemish in somebody, 
then it's going to be done to you. And if you punch, and this is pretty serious. This is a quite a strong deterrent. Because if you break somebody's legs, your legs are going to be broken. If you punch somebody in the face and they lose an eye, you're going to have one of your eyes taken out. So you see how this is a very strong deterrent for people to respect each other's person, right? That you don't just go and just assault people um, and be this, uh, you know, and you also as a vigilante don't go and assault people. It's something for the government to do. That's why when we talk about capital punishment, right, and the unbelievers just don't get it. It's like, no, we're not saying that we're going to go out and kill homosexuals, right? We, what we're saying is that if the government was doing a righteous job, then they, we would be able to bring somebody before two or three witnesses to a court of law, have them, you know, charged for the sin of homosexuality, and then the government would execute them and put them to death. That's what we mean by, you know, the death penalty for sins like homosexuality, adultery and whatnot. It's not just us being vigilantes and going out and doing the justice that the government should be doing. So again here in verse uh, 21, I wanted to show here, if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist and he die not, but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. So you see here, that's why I'm saying there's a distinction between the aggravated assault and this men striving together and you just causing a blemish in your neighbor and therefore it being eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If it's actually a, a fight that goes on, then there's just a fine and you have to just pay restitution and, and cause him to be thoroughly healed. Here's the third example of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And again, the eye for an eye, tooth for truth is carried out by, by government and it's a strong deterrent for the things that are mentioned in these three different examples. Deuteronomy 19, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. So this is where I think we get this principle from, even in a church, that is somebody is accused of something, it's up to the bishops, it's up to the elders to make diligent inquisition. You don't just go on what two or three witnesses say and then just accuse somebody and then just, do, just, just run on that. That is not doing your job as a judge, right? And the judge shall make diligent inquisition and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put that, the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And look at this. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Right? So you see here, that's the, the last example in Deuteronomy 19 of where this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is. It's in the case of a false witness. And that's why, that's the protection that the Bible has on the, on the sentence of capital punishment, right? Because you can't just, anybody just accuse people, right? And get them put to death. Because if diligent inquisition is made and you're a false witness, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to be put to death. And that should be the same in a church, right? If somebody wants somebody excommunicated and they're a false witness after diligent inquisition, then that person should be excommunicated until they obviously repent of the false accusation, right? Whatever they wanted done to that person where they raised the false accusation should be done to them. We can take some principles like this, I believe, from the Old Testament and apply it into church. But obviously the government should be applying this as part of, uh, part of the laws of the land. So hopefully that gives you a bit more insight into this turning the other cheek. Remember, you've heard that it had been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now you know what laws that actually applies to and why they were applying it wrong. Now he says, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Is he talking about the government not resisting evil? Is he talking about Christians not desiring that the government resists evil? No, he's just saying that you don't take the law into your own hands. That's what I believe this is talking about. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. You see, you don't fight back. You go through the right course and do the right thing just because you're defrauded like in first corinthians 6 it doesn't mean you have the right to defraud uh, and do the wrong thing 
And that's why I think verse 40 says, if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Which means hey, if somebody does defraud you, you have to sometimes submit to the judgment of the courts, even though you don't believe it's a right judgment, right? That you've been defrauded, you still submit yourself to the authority of the land, if it's not a sin, obviously, to do so. Romans 12, we see here, recompense to no man, evil for evil. So you see here, it's not evil when you go about the right way of dealing with conflict. That's not evil. You're doing the right thing, right? By, by going through the church or whatever, or going through the court system, you're doing the right thing. Um, you're not just taking law into your own hands and c recompensing to a man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, so here's the long suffering, right? And the, and the, and the forbearance. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. So you want as much to strive for peace and strive for unity, but that's not always possible. And bottling it up and just letting it go is not always the right course of action, like we talked about. There can be bitterness that comes from that. Lack of fellowship, the break in fellowship. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. So you see here, you don't take it into your own hands. You go about it the right way, but rather give place unto wrath. See, so it's not saying that there is no way to go about it. There's a place for the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And somebody might say, ah, oh, there you go. It's just leaving it to God, right? And just all you do is just, you just pray about it. Government doesn't get involved. No other, you know, no going to them and going with two or three witnesses going. None of that. They just say, oh, you just leave it for God, right? Just, you just suffer. No, that's not what it's saying when it says, give place unto wrath. Uh, let me explain. So it says here, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. So see, you always do the right thing. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So it's not that you don't do anything. You just overcome the evil that is done to you by doing the right thing. Now, this is the end of Romans 12, right? So Romans 12 is talking about don't recompense evil for evil, overcome evil with good, give place unto wrath. And this leads right into, if you know your Bible very well, Romans 13, right? And Romans 13, it says, let every soul, it's talking now about the government, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. So it's not teaching that we just do everything that government tells us to do, right? Because obviously government might tell you to do something that's sinful. You obey the, the higher power. God is higher than the government. But there is a place for government, for there is no power but of God, and I just want to, I've just underlined how many times it talks about of God, the ordinance of God. Because remember, you give place unto wrath. For why? Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Right? So we give it to God. But one way we give it to God is sometimes we do need to go to the government. Right? The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, right? The power is the authority. Resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? What power? It's talking about the government, right? The government that is put in power. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So see, the government's job is to punish evil. And that's why when we start disobeying the government, is when the government starts punishing good, right? That's why when they're trying to legalize marriage and legalize homosexuality and all these things, that's why you don't obey the government, right? But when the government is doing right, that's when you support the government doing right. Look at this. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. See, so when we give place unto wrath, that is the place of government to come down on with God's wrath to punish the evildoer. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. So you see, so it's not just fines, it's not just jails. It's saying he's bearing a, a sword because a sword is about capital punishment, right? It's about actually killing somebody. He beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for, for this cause you pay tribute. So this is one of the reasons why we should pay taxes, right? We do pay taxes, the Bible says in the Bible, um, because part of those taxes are to pay for a government who is the minister of God to execute judgment on people. Look at this. For they are God's ministers, 
See, the government is meant to be serving God's will by carrying out justice on those that do evil, attending continually upon this very thing. So that's the purpose of government. If, that, if we have the laws that God wants us to keep, how is it evil of a Christian to desire that government do their job? Do you know what I mean? Like if somebody commits murder and somebody says, well, you know, the government should be putting them to death and everyone says, oh, that's so hateful. How is that Christian? How is it not Christian to desire that the minister of God do their job of punishing evildoers? You know what? So that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the uh, job of government. Now let's talk about false accusations because I was falsely accused, right? And I, want, I wanted to show you that there is a place where you can obviously, you know, because uh, people often wonder, like, why, why did I put out those videos? Why did I try and justify myself, right, and explain the situation? Well, it's because I think it's, there's nothing wrong with somebody telling their side of the story and, and answering false accusations that are made against them. And obviously, in some instances, there are false I don't know. I don't really know the laws about slander and whatnot, but I know like even in our government, there are laws. I don't even know, um, you know, whether, you know, people should even be doing that because I think if you don't actually lose anything, I don't know um, whether those laws are actually righteous or not. But in terms of just making a case for yourself to answer false accusations, I wanted to just go over um, Acts 24 because I find like Acts 24 where Paul is falsely accused of teaching heresy and being a troublemaker, I can't help but feel that his situation is so similar <laughs> to what I just went through. So Acts 24, uh, well, let's just read here. It says here, And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the government against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, right? So these people are accusing Paul of things, saying, seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness and that, by, and that very worthy deeds are done unto these nations by thy providence. So this is the, the orator that is talking to Felix, who is sitting to judge. We accept it always and, is, and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldst hear us of thy clemency a few words. I just love how even in the King James Bible seems to have captured this sort of uh, this eloquence of this orator that is just using all these fancy words, right, like lawyers do. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition amongst all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So isn't it funny how like when you try and, you know, uh, do something for God, right, you know, it's like these people, they, this is what they accuse you of. Right? They accuse you of being a troublemaker, right? A pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition, and they always accuse you of starting some cult, even though you're just preaching the Bible, right? He's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also had gone about to profane the temple, right? So he's going against the traditions, right, that are, that are happening. Whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself makest, uh, mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. So he's like, huh. So it's crazy that this Captain Lysias thinks what they were doing was wrong and thinks he actually deserves a just hearing, right? This is what Lysias said. He came upon us with great violence, right? He's taking Paul away. Why? Commanding his accusers to come unto thee. So this captain is saying, Basically, Paul should get a hearing, right? And he's bringing him, saying, if somebody's accusing you of this, then he gets this fair hearing. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. So you see, when Paul was falsely accused, he didn't just suffer and just let it go, right? I mean, when he was given the opportunity to present a case for himself, he took that opportunity, right? So that people would know that the accusations were false. I do, che I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. So what is he doing now? Now he's giving an account of what he's being accused of. And they neither, look at this, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Now, it wasn't just that controversy about the Trinity where false accusations have been thrown at me. I've been falsely accused within even Australia of doing things that I haven't been doing, 
right? And it's kind of like this, where they're saying that Paul did things, and it's like, I haven't done any of these things, you know? I, like, I was accused of being a sheep stealer, and it's like, I haven't stolen any sheep from any church. Like, I didn't go to any church. Like, you guys all came here yourself. Do you know what I mean? Like, so let's go back to here. There's neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogue, nor in the city. Neither can they prove, look at this, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. So it's, isn't it funny that he's saying here, they're saying that I did all these things, but where's the proof? You know, give me some justification of what you're accusing me of. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so this is one thing where they were accusing him of heresy, but he actually did believe some of these things. So I was accused of teaching heresy, but there are some things that I do actually believe. So worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So you see here, Paul is not doing anything wrong by giving an account of what they did, what has happened, he, what he believes, and he's saying, I don't have... You know, there's nothing wrong in my conscience. You know, I've always got a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me, or else let these same here say if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council." So you see here, he's even saying to them, you know, like, why don't they speak? And actually, the people that are accusing me, why aren't they here to actually, uh, you know, verify the story? Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. So isn't it interesting that even Paul recognized that there was one thing that he was bringing up, right, that they all disagreed with. And this is saying, in his instance, it was the resurrection of the dead that they were calling heresy. Right? And in my situation, it was obviously disagreeing with what had happened. But what happens even with Paul, that all these other things get brought up as well, that he has to defend himself from, that he's, he is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, and that he's this troublemaker and doing all these different things that were unrelated to what he was actually standing for. He says, the only thing that I actually did is that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question by you this day. So I think there is a place, you know, just to, just to touch on that question of, um, you know, false accusations brought against you and being able to make a case for yourself, but obviously going about it the right way. Now, the last thing I just want to cover is situations where someone has done wrong and it's not towards you. So we've talked about already situations where somebody does you wrong, right, and how, go, how to go about it. So these are situations where somebody does wrong to you and how you go about it. But sometimes you see somebody do something wrong, right? And how are you meant to handle it in that instance? Um, so a couple of thoughts here. When somebody has done something wrong, how do you go about handling it when it's not you that has actually been, been done wrong to? One first thing you have to ask yourself is, is the matter public or private, right? Because if the matter is private, then you don't want to bring it up in public, right? But if the matter is already public, then dealing with it in public, it's, it's already a public matter, right? So let's first talk about a private matter. Like you see a brother in a sin and, and no one really knows about it. It's a private matter, but it's not a sin against you. Do you go and correct that brother? You know, of course you do. Let's have a look into Galatians 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now we're going to look at Matthew 7 in a second, but we see here even a correlation with Matthew 7, that if you're going to remove the speck from somebody's eye, you need to consider first the beam that is in your own eyes. So it talks about considering yourself, because sometimes people get this holier, holy attitude of, I'm going to go around correcting everybody, and they just get this reputation of like, well, people just think you have nothing wrong because you're not doing it in the spirit of meekness where, you know, where you're going to them, you know, you're saying, you know, I'm not perfect, but, you know, this is something that we have to do as a church or as a brother in Christ. But this also shows that Christians that have this mentality of it's none of your business. Like you do something wrong and a brother in Christ comes to you that somebody in your church and deals with the problem. 
You can't, you, it's wrong for you to have the attitude of what's business. It's like, you know, some Christians have this attitude of like, what business is you? Mind your own business. No, no, that's the wrong attitude because the Bible tells us that if somebody is overtaken in a fault, we are meant to go and correct one another and look after one another and be, count, be accountable to one another and bear each other's burdens. And this way it fulfills the law of Christ. See, right? It's, it's the right thing to do because you are actually fulfilling Christ's law. Matthew 7. So again, so if you see somebody do wrong, you go to them, right? If it's private, then keep it private. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So you see here, the Bible doesn't just say, judge not. It's judge not that ye be not judged. Why? Because you don't want to be a hypocritical judge. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So it's not that once you deal with your beam that you just leave the moat in your brother's eye. No, once you deal with your beam, you go and you deal with the moat in your brother's eye. Right? Because the idea from Galatians 6 is that if they're overtaken in a fault, that ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. But one thing that we need to consider when we go and correct somebody, right, when the sin is not done against us, like I said, one thing is if it's private, you keep it private. But the other thing is, you've got to think about it, whether it's worth it, right? Because what does the last verse in Matthew 7, 6 say? It says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So you've got to decide, first of all, if I go and correct this person, is it worth it, right? Because if they're a swine or like a, what do they say? A dog, right? You know, and then they turn again and rend you. It might not be worth it. It might actually do more damage to you if you try and correct them, right? Or you might just be casting your pearls for swine. You might just be wasting your time because they're not even going to listen. So you've got to think about, you know, how to deal with this. And, and this shouldn't be that you just never deal with a problem because you're just saying, oh, nobody ever listens to me. That just shows that you have to build some relationships with people so that when your brother is in fault, that you have a good enough relationship to bring it up to them. So that's one thing to keep in mind, right? So that's the private situation, right? Where there is something that is private that is done and you go and deal with them and you decide, you know, is it worth dealing with? Now, what if there is a public thing that is happening, right? There's a public issue that is happening. And do us as Christians, do we sometimes, do us as Christians, are we meant to just, just mind our own business all the time? Well, my, my question is, well, when there was something that was public happening in 1 Corinthians, why didn't Paul just mind his own business, right? It's because sometimes, sometimes, oh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but let's, let's look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So what's happening in this church is that there is this fornication happening in the Corinthian church where this guy is sleeping with his father's wife, and he's saying that it's reported commonly. This is not a secret. This is public knowledge. Everybody knows about it, but nobody's doing anything about it. To the point where even Paul hears about it. Right? And now Paul is making a comment about this public situation. He's saying, You're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, so he's, like, he's not even there, right? But it's reported commonly. Everybody knows this is happening but present in spirit have judged already. You see, he has a comment to make. He has a decision that he's made as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So you see, why didn't Paul just mind his own business? No, because it's, it's, it's reported commonly, and we'll see later on, that even in 1 Timothy 5, again, that there is, a, there is a place for open and public rebuke when the matter is public, right? Look at 1 Timothy 5. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Right? So, if, so if an elder is actually doing something openly in sin, sometimes there is a place 
It says here, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. So it's not always that everything that is done in public is rebuked in private. There is a place also for public rebuke when issues are public. I want to show you here a situation where Paul, you know, because back then we don't have the internet and whatnot, but here Paul actually does this to Peter, where Peter actually does something false and he actually withstands him to the face and he didn't because this is something that was done publicly, right? What Peter did wrong. And Paul didn't just go to him one-on-one, -on -one, first of all. He actually rebuked him publicly the first time he rebuked him. Look at what he says here in Galatians 2. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So you see here now the actions of one man are now affecting the actions of other people. And that's often what happens in churches, right? Where the actions of one man, even in another country, affect people in this church, right? He says, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So you see here that he didn't just go to Peter by himself because Peter did something. He was an elder. He did something public. He rebuked Peter before them all. See, so there is a place where there is public rebuke. Now, I had another passage I wanted to show you. I must have forgotten to put it in, um, in here, but I've got it in my notes here. Proverbs 26, 17. And like I said, there is always wisdom, even when we talk about dealing with a private matter and, and whether or not, you know, you're going to cast your pearls before swine and, and they're going to tear, uh, turn again and rend you. There is this passage in Proverbs 26, and I'll just read it to you. It says, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. So I'm not saying that just everything that happens in public you need to comment on, right? Because like I said, you need to decide whether it's worth the, the trouble of dealing with that conflict. But see, Proverbs 26, 17 is just saying, never deal with any public conflict, just mind your own business. It's saying, he that passeth by and melleth with strife belonging not to him. Right, so why did Paul deal with the issue in the Galatian church, right, with Peter, and he rebuked Peter before them all? Because it was something that was belonging to him, right? It actually affected his circle. It was even carrying away Barnabas, right? Because Barnabas was one of his close mates that traveled with him. And then you have even in the Corinthian church, where it wasn't exactly the church he was going to, but it was a church, it, it was something that he cared about, right? It was something that he cared about, that, that he loved, and he knew that they were being affected, so he made a public comment. But I'm not, I'm not saying that therefore we publicly comment about everyone's issues, because like, if you were to do that, it would just take a full-time job, right? To deal with every public issue in every church. Sometimes it is just taking a dog by the ears, they say, and meddling in strife that doesn't belong to you. Um, so I'll end on that point, right? So what's the conclusion? Hopefully you guys learned a lot. Sorry, I know it was a really long sermon, but hopefully it was interesting enough that it kept your attention. But just this idea, remember we talked about this Ned Flanders Christianity, right? Just this idea that the most Christian thing to do or the more Christian thing to do is just to simply just suffer this wrong, just bottle it up, not deal with conflict. No, no, there is a way to deal with conflict. And often the passages like Matthew 5 and 1 Corinthians 6 are misapplied to just mean that you just should just deal with it and just leave it to God. No, there is an avenue for restitution. There's an avenue for conflict resolution. The government has a place as well, and there is a time to escalate for government. So, like I said, not every situation is worth seeking restitution. Um, but if someone suffers wrong, seeking resolution, restitution is not wrong, as long as it's done in the right way. All right, okay, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you for uh, just the many examples and instructions that we can piece together, Lord, get a full and sound doctrine. Uh, pray, Lord, uh, that you give us wisdom, because even though we have clear instructions, it's not always easy to do the right thing. 
And we just pray again, Lord, for this, uh, this marriage plebiscite that's happening. And Lord, pray that you'd help us to take a, a strong stand, even if uh, it, it marriage, same-sex marriage goes ahead. But I pray, Lord, that our government would take the stand that it should take as a minister of God. And Lord, not only that, but we would strive to turn back laws that have legalized homosexuality, legalized same-sex parenting and de facto parenting. And Lord, Lord, I, Lord I pray that one day we'll have the laws uh, that you intended for a government uh, implemented in our nation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.